Now that you've been introduced to the classical approach for hypothesis testing about amine, let's look at the p-value approach. So here are your steps for using the p-value approach for testing hypotheses about amine. Step one, again, is determine the null and alternative hypotheses. Step two is to select a level of significance, alpha, depending on the seriousness of making a type one error, just like it was for the classical approach. And remember, for us in the textbook, alpha is always given to us. Now here's where the two approaches differ. Step three of the p-value approach is to compute the test statistic, just like we did for the classical approach, but then use the t-table to translate the test statistic into a p-value. So it turns out that the p-value is nothing more than the area beyond the test statistic. And then in step four, we compare. If the p-value is less than the level of significance, we reject the null hypothesis. And if the p-value is more than the level of significance, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, before we go on to use the p-value method to actually do a hypothesis test, I'd like to draw this on a diagram for you and give you a little clearer idea of the difference between the p-value approach and the classical approach. Now, I know you'll remember from when we talked about the classical approach how alpha is the level of significance and alpha is the area in the tail of our normal curve. And the t-score that marks off that area of alpha is what we called the critical value. And remember that this shaded region here, which is equal to alpha, was also called the rejection region. If our test statistic falls in the rejection region, then we reject H0. And if our test statistic falls in the clear region, then we fail to reject H0. So now let's draw ourselves a test statistic. This test statistic is, of course, in the rejection region and the p-value is the area beyond the test statistic. So in this case, you see the p-value here. Now notice that the p-value is smaller than alpha because you can see the rest of alpha peaking out here. So whenever the p-value is less than alpha, that necessarily means that the test statistic is in the rejection region, and that means that we reject H0. On the other hand, suppose we have a much smaller alpha so that the critical value is further out. And suppose that our test statistic falls in the clear region. Well, in this case, the p-value would be larger than alpha. In order for the test statistic to fall in the clear region, the p-value has to be larger than alpha. So whenever p-value is larger than alpha, that means the test statistic is in the non-rejection region and that means that we fail to reject H0. So I hope these diagrams will help you understand the difference between the classical approach and the p-value approach. With the classical approach, we shade alpha and we draw the critical value on our normal curve. And we compare the test statistic to see if it falls in the rejection region or not. But with the p-value approach, we are comparing areas. So with the p-value approach, we just want to see if the p-value is less than alpha or if the p-value is larger than alpha. Now, since p-values are difficult to obtain from the t-table itself, we usually rely on technology to calculate p-values for us. So we are about to run the same three hypothesis tests that we ran when we talked about the classical approach but this time we will use the statistical function on the calculator. Remember that the requirements still apply. Either the sample must contain no outliers and must come from a normally distributed population, or the sample size must be at least 30. So here is our first example. We looked at this same problem when we did the classical approach. I'll just go through it again with you quickly. It says the mean height of American males is 69.5 inches. The heights of the 43 male U.S. presidents, Washington through Obama, have a mean of 70.78 inches and a standard deviation of 2.77 inches. Treating the 43 presidents as a simple random sample, determine if there is evidence to suggest that the U.S. presidents are taller than the average American male, 
use the alpha equals 0.05 level of significance. Note that since we're treating the 43 presidents as a simple random sample, we are allowed to use the t-test here because n is greater than 30. So as you remember, the first thing we need to do is write our hypothesis pair. So the null hypothesis would be that mu equals 69.5, and the alternative hypothesis would need to be that mu is greater than 69.5. So there's our hypothesis pair. Now let's go ahead and pull up our calculator. So to access the statistical tests, all you need to do is press STAT, and then right arrow over to the tests submenu. So I'm going to right arrow twice. And now the test that we want is the t-test. So you can either press two or you can arrow down and press enter. And here's the screen for the t-test. Now the first thing the calculator is asking you is whether you want to base your test on data or on statistics. We do not have the raw data here, so I'm going to arrow over to statistics and press enter. Okay, now mu sub zero is the number from your hypothesis. So mu sub zero for us needs to be 69.5. Now x bar is the mean from your sample. So x bar for us needs to be 70.78. Okay, now standard deviation is the standard deviation from the sample. Notice that because we're doing a t-test, it's asking us for sample standard deviation because whenever we do the t-test, it's because we don't know the population standard deviation. So the sample standard deviation is 2.77. And then n equals 43. Remember, n is sample size. And here the calculator is asking us what type of test we're doing, whether it's two-tailed, left-tailed, or right-tailed. You can see, of course, that ours is right-tailed. So I will arrow down and then right arrow twice to select the greater than mu sub zero. And now I will calculate and press enter. Okay, now what the calculator is giving us here is the test statistic and the p-value. So we can see now that p-value is 0 0.002. So since the calculator gave us a p-value of 0 0.002, we can see that that is much smaller than alpha. And since the p-value is less than alpha, we know that we're going to reject H0. Just to link that to what we remember from the classical approach, if this is alpha and your p-value is 0 0.002, then the p-value would be very small compared to this alpha, and that would mean that the test statistic would have to fall in the shaded region. And so you can see that we would have to reject H0. Now, to phrase our results, we'll say that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that H1 is true. So we'll say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean is greater than 69.5. Now here is our second example. This one said the mean waiting time at the drive through of a fast food restaurant from the time an order is placed to the time the order is received is 84.3 seconds. A manager devises a new drive through system that he believes will decrease wait time. He initiates the new system at his restaurant and measures the wait time for 10 randomly selected orders. The wait times are provided in the table is the new system effective? Use the 0 0.1 level of significance. And here are the 10 wait times that he measured. Now remember, before we use the t-test, we need to verify that all the conditions are met. Since n is less than 30 here, we really should look at a box plot and verify that this sample contains no outliers. And we also should look at a normal probability plot to confirm that it's reasonable to assume that this data came from a normally distributed population. Since we already did both of those things when we did this problem by the classical method, I won't do it again, but I wanted to remind you that we do have to think about those things. Now we need to write our hypothesis pair. The manager wants to see if the new population average using his system is less than 84.3. 
So our null hypothesis would be that it still equals 84.3, and our alternative hypothesis would be that it's less than 84.3. Now let's go back to the calculator. This time, since we were not given a sample mean and a sample standard deviation, we will use the raw data that they gave us. So I have already entered those 10 numbers into my list one. And so once you get those 10 numbers entered, what you'll do now is go stat, arrow over to the test submenu. Again, it's the t-test, so it's option number two. This time, we don't have the summary statistics. This time, we do have the data. So arrow over so that data is selected and press Enter. And now we can just arrow down and put in the information that we have. Remember, mu sub zero comes from your hypothesis. So that's not something the calculator can automatically know. We will need to enter that number ourselves. And now the list is the list where you have your data stored. So of course I stored mine in list one. I'm going to leave that the same. And frequency is one. It's possible for you to have numbers stored in one list and the frequency stored in a different list. Of course, we just want to count each number one time. So you can leave frequency at one. Now we need to tell the calculator what type of test we are running. This would be a left-tailed test, so we need to highlight the less than mu sub zero and press enter. And now you can just go down to calculate. And here you can see our test statistic is negative 1.310 and our p-value is 0.1113. So the calculator gave us the p-value of 0.1113. We compare that to alpha and you can see that our p-value in this case is greater than alpha, and that means that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, just to put this on a diagram for you, if alpha is here and this is 0.1, then p-value would need to take up more room than that, and so you can see that your test statistic is actually going to fall in the non-rejection region, and so you fail to reject h naught. And now to phrase our results, we would say there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean is less than 84.3. Notice that all the calculator really did for us when we used the t-test command was calculate the p-value for us. The calculator doesn't really tell you what the results of your hypothesis test should be. The calculator doesn't understand about rejecting h naught or failing to reject h naught. That's what you have to supply, but the calculator can at least just give you the p-value. And now we are back to the Snickers factory. So remember this one said the fun size of a Snickers bar is supposed to weigh 20 grams. Because the penalty for selling candy bars under their advertised weight is severe, the manufacturer calibrates the machine so that the mean weight is 20.1 grams. The engineer is concerned about the calibration. He obtains a random sample of 11 candy bars, weighs them, and obtains this data. Should the machine be shut down and calibrated? In other words, is the mean weight of the population of candy bars different from 20.1? Now, when we did this with the classical approach, they provided us with a box plot and a normal probability plot so that we could ensure that this sample meets the requirements for the t-test because this is a small sample. n is less than 30. So before we just jump into the t-test, it's important to note that we've already looked at the box plot and verified that this sample contains no outliers, and we've already looked at the normal probability plot and verified that the population that this sample was taken from is normally distributed. Now we can write our hypothesis pair. So you may remember when we did this for the classical approach, we came up with a hypothesis pair of our null hypothesis was mu equals 20.1, and our alternative hypothesis was mu is different from 20.1. Let's go ahead and pull up the calculator. And again, I already have our data entered in list one, so you would need to enter that data. And then we would press stat, arrow over to the test submenu, choose the t-test, which is number two, and then let's put in our numbers. 
We do have the raw data entered in list one, so leave data selected, arrow down to mu sub zero and enter 20.1 for mu sub zero because that's what comes from our hypothesis. Then arrow down to list, make sure that the list indicates where your data is, mine is in list one, frequency of one, and then arrow down to the type of test. This is a two-tailed test, so we want to make sure that we select the not equal to sign. So make sure that's selected and press enter so that when you arrow down to calculate that that stays selected. And then you can press enter on calculate. And you can see here that our p-value is 0 0.3226. So with a p-value of 0 0.3226, we compare that to alpha, and we can see that our p-value is much larger than alpha. Therefore, we fail to reject H0. And to phrase our results, we will say that there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean is different from 20.1. Now you have to be careful with hypothesis testing because even if a hypothesis test leads us to reject the null hypothesis, it may be that the difference between the sample statistic and the mean in the null hypothesis has no practical significance. The larger your sample is, the easier it is to get a small p-value and thus reject the null hypothesis. You can prove all kinds of unlikely things if you get a sample that's large enough. For example, one research team did a study that showed that wearing a lab coat causes people to think more carefully. Another team did a study that showed that spanking causes cancer. And another team did a study that showed that autism is caused by highways. Of course, we don't believe any of these things. So just because a hypothesis test showed that it's so, doesn't always mean that it's so. You cannot abandon your common sense. Here's a quote from the website wmbriggs.com. He said that epidemiology, which is a branch of medicine that deals with the incidence, distribution, and possible control of diseases, is nothing if not a productive field. All that's needed for success is a database, the larger the better, a disease, any will do, and some minor facility with statistical software. You saw how easy it was for us to put the data in our calculators on the previous few slides, and we didn't have to think at all about whether the test was appropriate to do or not. Of course, we had already thought through all of that when we did those examples in the classical approach. But in real life, researchers really need to think about whether the underlying population is normally distributed, or whether the sample size is large enough they have to decide if the test is an appropriate one to do. And they also need to be careful about whether they're just getting the results they want because they're using such a large sample that it's easy to get a small p-value. There's an old saying in statistics that you can find in a book by Daryl Huff called How to Lie with Statistics. He said, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. And I know we've all heard the old saying that there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. So if statistics is a science that we can use to get real information, why is it that people don't trust it more? Why is it that people seem to think you can lie with statistics? Well, I think that's because people use it improperly. People use statistical tests and confidence intervals on data that are either improperly gathered or that come from populations that just don't lend themselves to these methods. So if something violates your common sense, don't change your mind just because a hypothesis test tells you to reject the null hypothesis. We are still responsible for understanding how these hypothesis tests can be used, and we are still responsible for making sure that the results we get make sense. Now I know that once you get out into your careers, most of you won't actually be running hypothesis tests of any kind. However, some of you will be reading research that's based on hypothesis tests. So I hope that this exposure to the little bit of hypothesis testing that we've done has helped you to see some of the considerations that need to go into hypothesis testing so that when you read research that's based on hypothesis tests, you'll at least have a little bit of an idea of what they're talking about 
and you won't just have to blindly put your trust in a process that you don't understand at all.